My name is John Dick and I'm a senior scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto and the University of Toronto. I grew up on a you know small farm in the middle of Canada. I went to a one-room school. Um, the high school that I went to uh, actually never even had biology so I took the sort of the hard you know, physics math but I never had actually biology. But I like to tinker and right? I grew up on a farm and I like to take things apart and I guess if there's one thing that um, perhaps predicted uh, that I would go into science was that, that I like to figure out how things work. So, you know, science in the end uh, became a puzzle uh, to figure out how things work. My lab studies the blood. Um, we're very interested in understanding how normal blood works, how the normal blood system works, and how the dark side um, also works. Stem cells are the business end, if you like, of the blood system. And uh, we have been focused actually from the beginning of uh, having my own independent lab to really try to take this apart in the, in the human system. Uh, Two-thirds of people who actually need a transplant don't get it because they don't have a related donor. So if we could find ways of harnessing stem cells, uh, we could expand uh, cord blood banks and uh, other approaches to try to uh, increase the repertoire of uh, cells that are available for people who need it. People had shown in the 50s and 60s that you couldn't take human cells and put them in a mouse because the immune system would reject it. But in the meantime, there are these immune deficient mice that had been developed. These are mice that don't have an immune system. And as a consequence, they couldn't resist you know, foreign cells. And we thought, well, maybe you know, there's enough complementarity between what a mouse can provide and what a human cell needs. And if you don't have an immune system, maybe that would work. But it turns out that it does. It was you know, one of the uh, you know, one of those good fortunes of, uh, you know, of, of, um, that happened when that was an experiment that we started within, you know, I think a year or two of beginning my lab uh, many years ago now. And so that turned into an odyssey that we're still following. When we had devised this ability to put human cells in a mouse, we thought, well, can we put leukemia cells into mice as well? And it turns out that works. You can actually take human leukemia cells and transplant them and that then set us off, and so that was the first step to, you know, study them and find drugs, but you're actually studying the real human disease. Um, and um, <clears throat> over the years, we've come to recognize that we could then get at another, what turned out to be a fundamental question, and that is, is every cell in a cancer equal? And is every cell in a cancer equally able to keep that cancer going, keeping long-term propagation? And so we asked the question, is every cell in a cancer able to initiate a graft if we transplant it in a mouse? And the answer is no. It was about you know, one in 100,000. It varied from patient to patient, but really only rare cells had that ability. And so we went on and studied those cells in more detail, and we realized that this is a discrete population of cancer cells that have stem cell properties, and they make the remainder of the, of the, of the tumor clone. And one of the first things that became clear was, these cells, you know, in leukemia, many cells are proliferating, and that's why in the leukemia I study, AML, uh, you can give chemotherapy and you can put patients into remission very effectively. More than 80% of patients can be put into remission by exposing them to chemotherapy drugs which kill proliferating cells. But the problem in AML is that a vast majority of these patients are going to relapse in the next year or two. And what we come to recognize is that the stem cells actually can lie dormant. In fact, they're not cycling at all. And so they can you know, swim in a sea of chemotherapeutic drugs and they're not touched by it. And so they're really powerful cells that we need to understand in order to make progress. What the ACR did was it, it exposed me to the breadth of uh, cancer research, uh, you know, beyond the, the sole study of stem cells or leukemia. And uh, for that, I'm actually you know, incredibly grateful. It's a place where we can learn from each other. And I think you know, there are principles about uh, leukemia and stem cells uh, that uh, are sort of universal. In fact, that they've sort of led the way. And I think that this is the place where we, we and, and others have been able to um, take those ideas and, uh, and uh, let them distribute into the sort of the solid tumor world. And vice versa, we've learned a lot, I think, on the, on the blood side uh, by being exposed to the kind of problems and the kind of technologies that people had to bring to bear in the solid tumors. It's actually been very informative. So I think that is the essence of what the AACR should do, is it brings to pe together people in disparate areas, uh, and we can learn from each other. <laughs>